All right, we're just contemplating whether we should, uh, you know, Christmas next week, right? We have uh, lots of things going on. <laughs> we've got a Christmas concert uh, coming up on uh, Friday, right? Uh, is that Friday? And then Saturday is the caroling. And then Sunday uh, is the you know, Sunday service, worship service, right? That's a Christmas Eve. And then a Monday is Christmas Day worship, Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, back to back. I'm just wondering, on, uh, this is up to you. I'm not, not going to push it, but I'll be happy to. On the Christmas Eve, do you want to have Sunday school? I have no problem. I would be uh, happy to have it um, if you are keen. Okay. Yeah, that I would, okay, then we will keep it. And, but um, Christmas Day, we won't have Sunday school. Uh, because all the other preparation needs to be done. Choir needs to prepare, the kitchen needs to prepare, everybody needs to prepare. Okay, so we stay within on the uh, Christmas Eve. We will have um, Sunday school. Okay, uh, that would be great. It would be wonderful to... Uh, this is how we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate it by reading the Lord's Word. That is just so good. Really so good to, to have this, to desire this, to say this is why we come to the Lord's house. Okay? Um, during the week, I was in the Waterford Plaza. And um, because there was meant to be a market, Christmas market, and they advertised it, and Eldin said, there's a you know, Christmas market, lots of food, many shops. So I thought, you know, that day we, we, we thought, let's bring the kids out. So we went. There's nothing there. Lots of food. It's the usual same shops. Nothing was there. So we walk around, wanted to go off. I might as well have dinner here. So we went to Nando's. Right? And then coming out, there was a group of people. Uh, they are from, uh, looks like they're from another church. Right? And they set up a big marquee, they had face painting, they have pamphlets to hand out. So they, one came up to me and asked, um, yeah, here's a free gift for your children. Take it, take it. Uh, it's a little pack and, and go ahead and have I say, well, thank you. And so she said, are you a Christian? To say, yes, smiling. And then she, next thing, she hands me a little, uh, you know, invitation card. Well, uh, we have something on next Sunday, right? And that Sunday, don't go to your church, come to ours. <laughs> Bring your whole family, tell your friends, come to ours. We got bouncy castle, we got barbecue, we got... I used to smile at her. I'm not sure whether she, she probably don't know this, that she's talking to the pastor. <laughs> just smiled at her, thank you very much, I walked off. We're not going to have bouncy castle, you know. So if you don't see me next Sunday, you know where I am. <laughs> you know, this is such a joy that, you know, nothing else draws us. What do we do? The word of the Lord. The Lord himself. Worship. Nothing. <laughs> you tell me nothing. You ask me whether I'm a Christian, you got to present me nothing but bouncy castles. <sighs> ah. No, thank you. So it really made me think about what do we want to do this Christmas? It's certainly not bouncy castle. How do we celebrate it? You know, I celebrate it by can I go deeper in my understanding, appreciation? of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Can I dis really discover Him afresh? Two, what I discover about Him, can I actually see it in reality in my life? And that's not an easy transition to make very often. Right? Very often we learn, okay, yeah, I understand, it's wonderful. But the transition from what we learn into reality in life, somehow, somewhere, Ah, it's hard. Okay, well, let me give you an example. Okay, this morning I, you know, I received an email from Michelle and she said, Pastor Chris, our 
uh, photocopying machine is meant to have this uh, feature that when the toner is low, it automatically sends uh, a thing to, to the supplier and they'll send cartridge. That's part of its feature. Guess what? It didn't do it. <laughs> it didn't do it. So yesterday when they put out all the bulletin, they panicked. No toner. So how are we going to do how are we going to print the notes? So Michelle was, did yeah, very, something very special. She said, don't worry, I got a mini printer at home. And uh, good thing, uh, it only printed bulletin. Cannot print bulletin. So she printed all these notes from her home computer. Which, thank God for her. Right? But see, here is it. It's meant to have all that. But then, it doesn't. I said, please go check it out with them. Please check it out with them. How come you say you was meant to do this, meant to do this, but it's not there. Right? Okay. Well, what does that got to do with anything? Well, this morning, we're going to try and take a look at a concept of that it is most wonderful. But we need to understand beyond saying, wow, this is wonderful. How does it really work in our life? And Paul literally spent his entire life trying to help people understand what it means for Christ to be in us. That is a really challenging thought. Easy to understand in the mind, but how does it really work in real life? Okay, well, let's pray together for a while. We're going to need God to help us with this one. Okay, well, let's pray. Our Father, we pray this morning that you would help us Help us to fathom and understand this wonderful yet challenging truth concerning how Christ indwells our life. We're going to need your grace, your wisdom, your spirit to illuminate us and that grace to enable us to apply it to. We ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, when we turn to Colossians chapter 1, okay, for, uh, let's take a look at this. Okay. And then we come to, <clears throat> almost to the last part. And so Paul speaks about his uh, the ministry, and he talks about why he ministers the way he does. Okay? And then he says in verse 26, right? The mystery which, uh, 126, which has been hidden from the ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Okay, now this is something that is we want to really take note of. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Okay, we see this uh, mystery among the Gentiles in particular. Right? Not that it doesn't apply to the Jews. It is both. It is to all believers. But the Colossians church was made up predominantly of Gentiles. So Paul wrote it to help the Gentiles understand this wonderful truth as well. That this is for them. They are not second class citizens in the kingdom of God. There is no second class. You see, to the Jews, yes, you can be part of, but not exactly the same as us. We are the original chosen uh, people, right? And then you came later. You are, yeah, you come, but you are not exactly the same. That's a sobering thought, but it's there. Okay, this, we're going to try and understand this. So Paul is writing to encourage them. 
and says to them, uh, look at this, to them, with reference to Gentile believers, right? This is revealed. It has been revealed. The, the, the challenge and difficulty is whether you understand, right? Something can be revealed to you. Right, let me show you. Do you understand it or not? And so God willed, in God's will, will, this will part is, not, is actually a verb. Meaning God actively exercising His will. Now that is a, a very, very special construction. He is exercising His will to make known this mystery. What are the, and He calls it the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is it? And Paul sums it up first in one statement. And he says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that is really quite a profound thought. Right? What does it mean to have Christ inside us, right? Christ in you. Very personal, right? Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is the difference between us being in Christ and Christ in us? You see a difference? Right? What does it mean to be here is us, we in Christ, a little bit easier to understand, right? Here is the Lord Jesus Christ and all He represents, right? Ephesians 1, the blessings of God, every possible wonderful blessing of God is found in Christ. So when we put our faith in Christ, these blessings are available to us. This is a question of whether we understand it, whether we believe in it. And through faith, these blessings are released. Right? That, okay. But then, how does Christ, this is us, and then Christ in us. What does that mean? Okay, and, and this, is, this is what we've got to try and ponder understand you know, as, as much as we can this morning. Okay, right? Let's take a look at this. Okay, now first we talk about this whole idea of what is this mystery? You, did you, you try reading the Messianic Psalms on your own? Is it a mystery? Try to read it without the New Testament references. You wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't have a clue. Yes, Messianic. This morning uh, would be Psalm 110. You are a priest forever, uh, forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. How's that reference to Christ? Right? Next week, we will look at Psalm 118. Right? The stone that has been rejected have become the chief cornerstone. How is that? How is that messianic? You see the idea of a mystery? Is it messianic? Yes. Now, meaning New Testament, it has been revealed. Right? To the saints, to the apostles, to faithful men of God, entrusted with this ministry of helping people, preaching, teaching, helping people to understand this glorious truth, Christ in us. Right? Like I said, it's okay, uh, Christ in us. Okay, it's there. But how does it actually work in real life? How does it actually work? And that's the most difficult part, I feel. You know, on the one hand, it's like the printer. Okay, it's all there. We have all these rich features there. But how come in reality, it's not working? 
is not working. Okay? So you mustn't uh, look at Paul. Look at how much he has to go through to uh, help people to come to this. Okay? Now, let, let's try and, and, and try and figure this out. Really try and figure this out. Okay? <clears throat> okay, let's read on. And then he goes on to say, uh, Him we preach, warning every man teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Eh? Is it the way around? Right? So, first, he is talking about how Christ is in us. This is a mystery. This was hidden and what does it take to understand the things of God now? How do we understand this whole, I think, uh, whole, whole idea of a mystery? Okay, T let's turn to 1 Corinthians a little bit. Okay, now let's try and figure out this phrase. What does it mean for... Paul to say it was hidden in ages and generations. What does that mean? Okay, now let's turn to 1 Corinthians. And then chapter uh, 2, sorry, we read in verse 6. 2, 6. Right? And then 2, 6 we read, However, he says, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. Nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak wisdom, the wisdom of God in a mystery. Okay? Now let's just try to understand this whole idea of what is the, uh, this idea of this mystery. Hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. You see that? Second, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, reading. Okay? And then none of the rulers of this age knew, for they had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? And then cites the scripture, I has not seen nor ear heard the things that have entered the heart of man. Right, which God has prepared for those who love Him. Now, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. By, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of God except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. But we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. We might know the things of God that has been freely given to us. Okay, now let's try and understand what is this. Okay. What is this mystery? Wisdom of God, right? Knowledge of God, plans of God. This would be included in this they call mystery. It has been concealed, right? The world, people cannot understand it without the Holy Spirit. He reveals. Okay? To understand, to unlock this, to understand this, you need the Spirit of God to be inside you. Revealed to you. Made known to you. In other words, man cannot figure out, understand the plans of God by themselves. 
Right, you talk about, there are people who say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Bible myself. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to understand God. You can, in t- ages and generations, you can carry on. You won't come close. You won't. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. Right? It's a closed book to you. You see this? So you need, what do you need? One, we need the Spirit of God. Two, you need servants of God. And Paul was one of those servants of God. Entrusted, that's what he says. Being entrusted, I got to fulfill this. Okay? Otherwise, we won't be able to fathom what is God saying to me, what is his plan, what is his, what is it? I won't be able to. You you see this? Until we realize this, actually, we will not go anywhere with our faith. You, can I go deeper? No. Can I go wiser? No. Until we recognize this, for ourselves okay now it is a such a, a a wonderful yet necessary truth because people will try to figure things out themselves they, I don't need God to understand life I don't need God to understand what I need to do I can try and figure it out myself and God has designed it in a, such a way you can't you actually can't, right? That's what Paul is trying to say. If he, they had knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The fact is, they didn't. Okay, so it's up for us to say, how does God do this? How does it work? Right, and so Paul explained this whole idea. Well, let's turn back to Colossians. Okay, we're going to take up references here and there to, to help us to appreciate this. Okay? Ask questions along the way. This would be useful because this one is quite a challenging thought. Remember, one part of it is a spiritual matter. We need the Spirit of God to help us. Actually, another part of it, second part of it, is actually human part of it. Knowledge. Okay? So it depends on how much you actually know. You need that is, this is what I know, and whatever I know now has been opened to me. Okay, it's like a present. I'll give you a present. First, you don't have the present, nothing to talk about. And here's the gift. Wow, very nice. Our kids are all waiting. How many days Christmas? How many days Christmas? Every day, how many days Christmas? I'm fed up. Here's a calendar. Mark it. It cannot wait to open it up and... What is it that has been kept? This is called mystery for me. Prepared, not by Santa Claus, but by parents who love them. Isn't it? So God has prepared this for us. And He's also provided for us to know this, to know Him, to know His will. Right? And then to fulfill it too. You you see this? And so Paul is trying to help them. Look at this wonderful thing. He calls it the riches of the glory. It is glorious. I mean, we may not understand everything, but can you he calls it this is the riches of God's glory. What can be compared? The word rich here is that of opulence. In the physical world, there is riches. The same word is used here to describe a spiritual part of it, which is even greater. And God has set this aside, put it aside for you. Now, do you know how it works? 
And he says, how does that actually work? Christ in you. Right? Christ in you. What does it mean? How does Christ come into me? Now, we turn to what Jesus said. Okay? Begin with a promise. Okay, before we begin, is this promise of the Lord? Remember what the Lord promised He will also do? Right? Now, is this promise by the Lord? Now, we read this in John chapter 15. Who has the Lord promised this to? John chapter 14. Okay. Now, to, to understand this, right? Now, let's take a look at this promise. <clears throat> right? Now, and he says to them in John chapter 14, for, uh, 14, Let me just. Okay, now watch this in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, right? 14, 15. Okay, begin with this. This is a promise. If means if is unfulfilled. Okay, John chapter 14. (laughs) <laughs> a little bit of help. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Yeah, this is just recent our eye operation. Now happy can can read again. <laughs> uh, okay. Now let's take a look at this. John, this is a what so this is what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Right? And he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Right? Now, remember, if you love me, result, not just words. If you truly love me, in other words, this will follow. It's connected. That's the word if. Right? If you truly love me, then this will happen. You will keep my commandments and I will give you Spirit of God and He will abide with you forever. Right now. Okay. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me and He who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love Him and watch this manifest myself to him. Now, this word manifest is the idea of reveal. Okay, just bear that in mind, what Paul was saying. He is basically teaching what Christ has promised. Okay, reveal. Okay, we're trying to figure out how does Christ indwell us, right? Now, this is what Jesus, first begin with the promise. Okay, begin with the promise, and then he go on. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, again, repeat for emphasis, anyone, you don't have it, you can be Jew, you can be Jew, anyone means anyone. That's the idea. If Jesus was to say to the disciples, if you love me, then it is confined only to the disciples. Isn't it? This is open if anyone loves me. He will keep my word. Now, what is God, the Lord's commandment? It's His word. Okay? And my Father will love Him. Now, watch this. 
and we will come to him and make our home with him. There you go. Christ will do something special. He will come and make his home inside you. That is, begin with this promise. How does that work? Anyone. He is a love for the Lord because of faith in who he is. He is Savior. He's forgiven us of our sins. He's given us new life and we have believed in that. That is all the reasons I need to love Him. And the practical expression of loving Him as my Lord and Savior is, of course I would, have, I would keep His Word. I would know His Word. I will read His Word. I will believe in His Word. I will live by His Word. I will keep it. You do that. He does something special. I will come to you and make my home inside you. Okay, now, this is a promise. If, promise, fulfilled, it lies on whether this faith has love for the Lord. And that love for the Lord has resulted in, you, know, you I really want to keep the Lord's word. Struggle, yes, but keep the Lord's word. Right? Whatever you know, you keep. This is why we talk about, this is how we celebrate Christmas. <laughs> What draws me? The Lord's Word. Why? Love for the Lord. I want to learn. I want to understand. I want to keep. Okay, now we move on to another part. We call this prayer. It is the prayer of Jesus. How does this work? One, He gives this promise. Two, in John chapter 17, He prays. Okay? And John chapter 17, Jesus prayed. Right? Watch this prayer. And he prays in John chapter 17, in verse 6. Okay? And in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you, God, have given to be out of the world. There we go. What did Jesus do when he called his disciples, when he taught them and trained them and they followed them? What, no, we see, when we read the gospel, we only see the human response. Jesus, look at the divine part. How come he, he, he chose that one? How come he chose Peter? How come he chose? You know why he chose? He chose the one whom God has given him. That's a very interesting perspective. How close Jesus was with God, that he knew exactly which one God has given him. This one, Peter. This one, Andrew. This one, Nathaniel. This is whom God has given. Now, that is an amazing perspective. And I have, they are yours. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Do you see this? They have kept your word. Okay, this, this morning later on in worship, we'll be speaking about how Christ is our high priest who intercedes for us, who prays for us. What is his prayer? It's in John 17. Okay, now let's take a look at this. He prays for them. I have given them the words which you've given me. Verse 8, they have received. And they have known, right? Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So we never make general prayer. This is a very special prayer for the disciples present and future. Okay? 
We must distinguish because people who don't know the Lord, no point. First, pray for their salvation. That's the best thing to pray for. And a person who don't know the Lord is not saved, no point praying Christ in you. Who won't have a chance? This is for people who know the Lord and love the Lord. People who don't know the Lord, pray for their salvation. Pray that they can come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ first. Okay, so there are many prayers to make and you've got, we've got to discern which one. And Jesus was very, very discerning. And so he says, I do not pray for the world. Not that he never prayed for the world. He would have prayed that the far, you know, he desired no one to be perished, but to be saved. But this is just tells us, it's very specific here. He is praying for his disciples. And he says, this is what he's praying for. Okay? In verse 11, I'm no longer in the world. These are in the world because he is going to the Father. He would, he would die, in other words. Right? He understood this. And so he prays and says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. That they may be one. Now, look, look, look at this. They may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them. In your name, those whom you have, you gave me, right? Okay, not lost one except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. Okay, I have given them your word, the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Okay, this is true. The world will reject you. They will hate you. If the world loves you, you've got problems. <laughs> Maybe you are the, of the world. Right? They will, just as I am of the world. I'm not of the world, sorry. I do not pray that you take them out, but you should keep them from the evil one. Okay? It's not as we will get out of the world, therefore, no, we're in, but not part of. That's what it is. They are not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Now, that's what it is. We are set apart. Okay, so you've got to study the prayer of Jesus very, very carefully. Because it tells us of the process. His teaching, every time Jesus preached and does things, he is praying alongside prayer and ministry side by side. As he ministers, he is praying. God's, the Father's involvement. This is how we understand how does Christ actually come into us? It involves truth. It involves sanctification. It involves being disciple of Jesus. It's not zap, he comes into me. I receive Jesus, come into my heart. He's, uh, he's for, it's not. It isn't. Then we don't even understand what does that mean. It isn't. Consider what Jesus is saying. You need the background, the, the, the foundational work done. Years of teaching. Years of helping them see who He is. If they don't even know who He is, how do they recognize when Christ is inside them? What are you looking for? Right? Obviously not the physical thing. Well, is, am I going to look more Jewish? It isn't. It's got nothing to do with the physical. His heart, his spirit, his faith will be inside you. But first, see, this prayer was prayed at the end, not at the start, for obvious reasons. He was praying at the start. <laughs> I don't know what they're looking for. He can't. This is prayed at the end. Now that they have seen me, now that they know what I stand for, now that they have received my word, I pray for them. Y you see this? It's so beautiful. 
absolutely beautiful. You watch this, and my joy will be fulfilled in them. The joy of the Lord, right? And will be in them. Okay, now, he, he prays for them, he sanctifies them, he sends them into the world. All these things are done. Sanctified, set apart. And then verse 20, I do not pray for these alone. Now, this is special because this means it includes us. Not these means original disciple, but also those who will believe in me through their word. To all who will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching of the apostle, the writings of the apostle. That's why we read the re teachings and writings of the apostle. Right? To arrive at this faith. And this will be applicable to us now. Isn't it? Okay? Then he says that they may be one. Wow. See, the disciples, Jesus, one. God and Jesus, one. Disciples and the Lord, one. How about us? Same prayer, one. Look at that closeness. What does it mean to be one with each other? It's not easy to understand. Okay, I recently saw a photo of my friends who got married uh, over in Singapore side, Bethany. And, and even student pastor Ben Chong just recently got married. I look at the wife and look at him. Hey, they look alike. <laughs> They're only been married for a year. Then you look at the other couple, which I also know. Hey, the, the friends, they're there. How come they look alike? Huh? You know, student pastor Eugene and the wife, Yvette. Hey, they look alike. Huh? Of course, the child looks alike, look like them. Right? Yeah, that's sure. That's interesting. You can be one, but the challenge is, can you be one in heart and mind and spirit? And not everybody is like that. Right? It's difficult. You imagine, you, many years together, you'll be more one. Not always. It should be, but not all the time. Right? When you start finishing each other's sentences, then you're really one. One together in heart, in spirit, in mind, and wow, that, that would be amazing. Imagine that closeness. Love for the person. Right? And there is this a sense of oneness that is there. I, I really am inspired by the life of this person called Oswell Chambers. Just reading, uh, you know, uh, halfway already, his uh, biography. And it is, it is the standpoint of the wife. You know when Oswell Chambers died, and he died, when he died, I was reading the part up to the part where he s literally gave his all to serve the Lord. He could have done very well as a Bible. He was such an outstanding Bible teacher. From one student to thousands of students, in his three years, he has gone through marking correspondence, included 9,000 st students' papers in, in the Bible college plus outside. His goal was to help every single one to be able to fulfill what Paul is saying, Christ in you. That's just so remarkable. And he felt a call to go over to Egypt. The war broke out, World War I. And he's, you know, news of men dying, news of men just distraught. And he said to his wife, let's go leaving comfort of England. It, it was a big, nice place he had. And he left that behind without knowing what on earth is... He had never been to Egypt before. He just said one thing, God, we, we, we have chosen to give God everything and this is, we're going to be led by Him. We don't know where we're going, but we know the one who loves us is there. And he went. 
hardened soldiers. How do you win hardened soldiers to the Lord? By the way, his ministry there was only a few years, literally a few years before he died. He gave everything, set up, the wife was there alongside, preparing tea, preparing coffee. But what she did, perhaps God has prepared her for. She wrote down everything the husband taught, from the seminary to when he was there. Their marriage is only seven years, but seven beautiful years they were. This is a marriage literally special. Both loved the Lord. And there he was. The wife supporting his love for the wife. They had a little girl. And she brought so much joy to the people around. Ministering there is tough. Harsh heat. Insects everything and yet people saw him and say wow they, they look at him get, i'm gonna listen to you why you know we come because we have to this is a war you come you don't have to be here you come as a volunteer and they began to listen to him literally thousands packed in those few years thousands packed in and heard the gospel Lives were transformed and changed. He had a you know, stomach ache, don't know what it was. And the wife said, please go see the doctor. He says, no, the war is now breaking out. I don't want to take up a bed. What if a soldier needs him? The pain didn't go away. And so the wife urged him, go, go to Cairo, go and see the doctor. Finally went too late. It was a burst appendix. It was so weak. And the doctor had to tell the wife, I'm sorry. We've tried our best. To the shock of everyone. Because no one th would have even guessed God would take such an outstanding servant of God home so early. There was so much work to do. There were so many souls. To his thoughts, his understanding of the Word of God was so rich, personal, and deep. And those words, Oswell Chambers died. When I read that, I was so moved. And they, the officers said to the wife, would you stay? And you know what, who continued the ministry of Oswell Chambers, the wife, to the day she died. She took her husband's work. She'd written many, because she's the one who, you know, she's, she was being trained, and actually her ambition was to be the first woman secretary to the prime minister. She was very, very good, shorthand. And she used that to serve the Lord. She compiled the books, she published the books, she even taught, lectured in the faith and spirit of his husband. And not thousands now, but millions today are blessed. What if this is what Jesus is praying about? Is there that oneness with the Lord? Physically, Christ is not with us. Is his spirit not with us? Is his faith not in us? Is his vision not in us? Is his heart not in us? Christ in us is not a theory, not a concept. And so many professing Christians need to, what is Christ in us? This is the hope of glory. Nothing else is. What is your hope of glory? That is special. And so when Jesus prayed, one, look at this wonderful, look at this. In verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me. The Father, you want to know the Father, you look at Christ. The Father is in him. The love of the Father, the wisdom of the Father, the graciousness of the Father, 
The righteousness of the Father is in this man. And I in you. That is amazing. That they also may be one in us. You see the beauty of that, that the world may believe. How will the world come to believe when they see Christ in you? When the message becomes the man on the woman, that the world will believe. It is not debates, it is not this and that. How will the world believe when they see for themselves Christ in you? That is the hope of glory. That is the joy of every believer. But of course, right? Look at this prayer. And the glory which you gave to me, I have given them that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me, and love them as you have loved me. How will the world believe? How will the world know? How will the world know that God loves them when they see and understand and experience Christ in you? Christ in you. Isn't that beautiful? That is what it is meant to be. Is Christ in us today? You say if Christ in the church, I understand. Theologically, yes. Technically, correct. Has He redeemed us? Yes. But in reality, is Christ in you? If not, what is in you? Okay, now we've got to see this prayer. Look at the person called Paul. This is a personal example. Paul did not just speak about Christ in you. He lived by that truth. Now, how does he do it? Sometimes you need to look at the example of others. And Paul is a fantastic example. Galatians chapter 2 now. Two twenty, famous text, but you see it in the light of all this is really wonderful. 2.20. Okay. What does it take for Christ to be in us? How come some have Christ in them, others don't seem to have Christ in them? What is the personal decision you have to make? Is there something I must do? Now, this tool, no. God promised, right? He will do by faith. Jesus prayed for you. He knows what he's doing. Thank God for that. Now, where's the personal part? Now, let's take a look at Paul's personal part. Okay? And so we see this. And he says, I have been one crucified with Christ. Have we been crucified with Christ? We are dead to our sins. We are dead to self. One. Paul did. I have been crucified with Christ, right? Two, it is no longer I who live. Have we given up our own personal rights to God? It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Do you see this? One, he has died to his sins. He has died to self it is not me. I have no rights. Whatever I am is of Christ. That's a decision everyone has to make. You, if you don't make it, it's not going to happen. You know what? I'm not going to live for myself. That's what Oswell Chambers did. 
It is not where is the most comfortable place. Where is, it is one has to be the will of God. This is a need there. You know what? I'm there. God who calls me will enable me. God who is, if I only until I fully surrender every single part of me to the Lord, then Christ will be in us. But if we are, it, it is us, Christ is still on the outside. He's not in us. Our own reasoning, our own faith system. Along the way, yeah, we do this and that. But is Christ inside us? And a lot of people are unable to give up. They can part with money. They can part with time. But they cannot part with what they feel. This is, this is part of me. I, I still hold on to. If the Lord was to call you, go, serve, would you? Would you give up everything and go? Would you give up your rights? Would you give up your will? Look what Paul did and he says, it is no longer I who live. It's not my life anymore. My life belongs to God. What he wills to do with it, it is entirely up to him. You see, we want to live our life and, you know, it's like we want to have the cake and, you know, <laughs> eat it. I want to have this and yet I want to go to God. I want to live the way I want to live and yet I want to serve God. I want to grow in my faith, but I want to do what I want to do. It doesn't work. It won't work. You will constantly be weak. You will constantly be at a struggle. You constantly fail and become very, very frustrated with yourself. How does it really Christ in us? Remember, this is a very special gift. We're not talking mere salvation here anymore. Christ indwells us. Look at this. And no longer I who live. Now this, why did Paul make this choice? Christ lives in me. You see this? Christ in you. And he can say this. Christ lives in me. The life which I, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith faith in the Son of God. This is what it means to live the life that is for Christ, that is given up to Christ. You live in full dependence on God through your faith in Jesus Christ. That is really amazing and wonderful. I live by faith who loved me and gave himself for me. And until we have fully given up our life entirely to God, to Christ, then we can be used by the Lord for His will, wherever we are. Until then, Christ in us. You see this? So this is what Paul says, who loved me, gave himself for me. This is a no-brainer to him. This is wonderful because God gave himself. The Lord gave himself. Man, I'm going to give myself to the Lord. Okay? Now, very quickly, go back to Colossians to finish this part up. How, does, how do you see Christ in a person? What would you see? Now, you're going to see it very de definitely. You will see the power of God working in and through energizing the person. Unmistakable. And Paul said this in verse, back to Colossians 1 now, and the last part of it, in verse 29, he says, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. The idea here is the power of God is energizing him. He is laboring. The word here is he exhausts himself. 
Have you ever exhausted yourself for the Lord's work? You give everything and you do, you're so exhausted. Striving, this is of tremendous effort and energy poured out. For what? For Christ's glory sake. You watch a person whose Christ is in him. This is what he will do. You see this in Paul. Now, oh, people, I are uh, too tired. You know, I, 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 it's just too much work. It's too hard. It's too this. It's too that. Christ is not in you. You're just full of yourself. Look at Paul. I energizing. What is energizing? Until you pour yourself out, God is not going to pour Himself into you. Emptying of everything. You know what? I'm going to labor for the Lord. I'm going to strive for the Lord. You, know, you have many services. You are attending. Many of us are serving. The cheering preparation, the choir is singing. There's only 20 people in the choir. And I thank God for every single one who has exhausted themselves for the Lord's work. When I clap for them, I don't clap just because they sang well. They have given of themselves. And we honour them, we love them, we thank God for them. You know what I see? I see Christ in the church. You begin to catch a glimpse of the glory, of the hope of the glory of the Lord. Are they strong people? No, weak. We struggle. But you know what? I, Lord, let me come to you. You fill me with your strength. You fill me with your energy. You energize me until people do not see. How is it possible that a small group like that can sing like that? And I appreciate them, that they stand firm. That they say, you know, we've got to be here. We've got to support this. Same thing. We are going to have a group of ladies that will be leading in the Christmas, in uh, Christmas Day and caroling and all that. Small group of ladies. You think, some people say, well, women are not, you know, weak. <laughs> you see them. God will raise up strong ones to show His church it can be done. That the glory is not men to, to take, but the glory is to God to give. He will work. We are but earthen vessels. The power, the treasure is in God who pours it into us. You see this? This is the whole of glory, that when we give glory, we really give glory to God. Because we look at it, impossible, this isn't me. I could not have done this. I could not have, you know, how am I going to conclude the year? This is how I'm going to conclude the year, giving glory to the Lord. <laughs> because you think I, I did it? <laughs> Far from it. Give glory to the Lord. And so we end the year with giving glory to God. In Christmas time, in down memory lane time, you know how we're going to begin giving glory to God. We thank God for His glory, for His strength, His grace in David. What do we, when we experience all this, what are we seeing? We're seeing a little bit more of Christ in us. Until you do that, we could never understand Christ in us as a concept. Can't understand it. You have to experience it in us. And when people look at it, they see Christ. They see the glory of the Lord. They see the light of the Lord. They see the strength of the Lord. They see the wisdom of the Lord. Is this open to all? Yes, the Lord promised this. He prayed too. But you, are you that person? Are you that person? If you are, watch distinctively God's power inside you. That is the hope of glory. Okay? This is what faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. And it is a glorious faith to spend a lifetime sharing, helping people to understand it, living by it. That's what Paul did all his life. It's so much to look at.
an experience, okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that we would be greatly, greatly challenged to apply what we have heard, what we could understand. That you have promised this, the Lord Jesus promised this, for him to indwell us, to come and make his home inside us. That there is, he prayed for us in his high priestly prayer. Let us be that person who will decide, who will choose to truly be crucified with Christ, to die to self and to come alive to God, to give off everything we have inside us, surrender it to the Lord, and to receive and experience Him coming into our life, His presence, His wisdom, His power. Lord, may this word be fulfilled as we apply faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.